We're in the studio in the old RCA building, which is ironic because Fingerstyle Guitar Magazine started mastering their CDs here about three issues ago, and with the passing of Chet, um, it pulls in a lot of memories for everybody being here. And today I have uh, Chet's guitarist and good friend Paul Yandel with me to share some memories of, of his friend. Paul, I want to first ask you about when you first heard Chet and your first meeting with Chet. First time I ever heard him, I was about, uh, I don't know, <clears throat> 13 years old. And I, I come from West Kentucky, a 30-acre farm, and uh, lived out in the, on the, in the farm, you know, raising tobacco and all that stuff. And uh, Anyway, I heard him over WCKY. And the record I heard was <clears throat> I've been working on a guitar, which he, it was I've been working on a railroad, and he changed it and uh, played it on his L7, and, uh, and uh, which I didn't know at the time, but I do now. So that was the first record I heard of him. And mm -hmm. uh, from then on, I was uh, I was smitten. Well, at that time, were you playing guitar finger style, or I don't recall. Uh, maybe it's so far back. Uh huh. Um, I know a lot of people, when they first heard Chet, being that they've heard him before they actually saw him play, they mm -hmm. uh, had no concept of about what he was doing as far as pulling off so many parts and such. I think that I, I must have been playing a little bit because uh, if I hadn't have been, I wouldn't have been uh, so uh, <clears throat> enthralled with his playing and everything I wanted to do it, you know. So I imagine I was, I was on my way a little bit. Sure. Okay, well then, if we could continue and tell me about the first time you actually met him. Well, um, about let's see, I graduated school in '54, and about '53, I came down to Nashville and auditioned for the Grand Ole Opry uh, with the solemn old judge George D. Hay. He was having auditions at that time on uh, Wednesday, about one or two o'clock, I forget exactly. But anyway, I came down there with a friend of mine, and I parked down there. And it's up on the seventh and Union at the old building up there, old studios. And I parked my car down there and on the curb, and uh, we went up there, and I sat around the hall waiting to, to audition, and I didn't take my guitar and amp. And so George D. Hay come out, and he said, Well, son, said, uh, I got ten minutes left. Uh, I said, uh, Where's your guitar? And I said, Well, I can go down the car and get it. And he said, Well, we don't have time for that. Well, around in Studio C, they rehearsed for the Prince Albert show, and Chet was on it. And Chet was standing out there in the hallway. They was on break. He might have been smoking a cigarette or whatever, but he heard, he hears this. So he walks over and says, Hey, said uh, I'll tell you what, you can use my guitar. <laughs> and he walks back in the studio, and there goes all that trouble. He had a little old uh, Fender Deluxe. And he went back around and unhooked his amp, brought it in there in this uh, smaller studio, plugged it up, and he had, at that time, he was playing a Gretsch Roundup, and it's on those old Grand Ole Opry shows. It's the one he's playing Humorist on, some of those things. Mm -hmm. So he handed it to me, plugged it all up, got it on and everything, handed it to me, and here, play it, and walked out. Now, can you imagine? Here I am. <laughs> you know, 18 years old, and Chet did me that way. And so I went ahead and played and played terrible, I know. And when I got done, well, George D. Hayes said, well, we'll call you, you know, which that's that standard line. But who? I didn't care what they called me. Not after meeting after Chet, Chet. Yeah. and playing his guitar. And I, and I told him that later on years, later on, you know, when I came to Nashville. He didn't remember it. But can you imagine that... The, now, an ordinary person, musician, would do that for just a an unknown kid like that. And that's the way Chet was, you know. Well, you know, the truth is most musicians seem to be just the opposite that I've that's experienced. Right. They, they don't want you to touch their Wouldn't stuff. Wouldn't give you the time of day, you know. Yeah, don't touch but my But I mean, guitar. go to trouble to go get his amp and all that, you know. Well. But that's one of my great Chet Atkins stories, and um, that just is a good example of the type of person Chet was. Yeah. Well, I'd have to believe that uh, you weren't really meant to be there for the audition. You were meant to be there to meet Chet for the first time. Well, it might have been, uh, and then later on I got his autograph. I came down, and, uh, mm -hmm. which I still have that. Mm -hmm. But we stayed in touch over the, during the years, and I went in the Army. I, 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 well, I came, when I came down here, 
I got a job at Lubin Brothers, which everybody knows, I guess. And, and I, I had something wrong. I had one of those uh, red gretches of 6120s, and the pickups were weak or something. And I couldn't get any volume over the operating. He says, come out to the house Sunday, and I'll take a look at it. So I go out his house, and, and I still remember that. That was a big thrill. And it was that studio where he on the front of that album where it says Chet Atkins Workshop where he's sitting there in his uh-huh. console and, but then I went in the army and he kept he'd write me every now and then in the army and give me a report on what's happening in Nashville and so when I came out I worked with different ones and I wound up working with Jerry Reed later on for about four years and, and then after Jerry uh, uh, Chet offered me a job or I went over and asked him for a job and he hired me and it uh, that was in '75, and it lasted for 24 years until he got sick, quit. We never had a crossword. It's the greatest job in the world. He's the best friend I ever had. <laughs> like a sec- second father, I assure you. Well, it's a blessing. I know. It. I can't imagine a guitarist having a greater opportunity and of, of, of such. To play for your hero and such a legend and such a, a great man, and to top it all off, you also worked with Jerry Reed. So you two, two, two. Well, I've been the luckiest guy in the world, you know. If uh, if I never hit another note, I couldn't complain because I've done more than I ever dreamed. I never dreamed when I was back holding tobacco back there, dreaming about coming to the, playing the Grand Ole Opry. I never dreamed all this would happen to me, you know. Mm-hmm. It's just amazing. You know, when I first heard heard about you, Paul, and that you were playing with Chad Atkins, the first thought that came to my mind, I was probably 15, 16 years old and struggling to learn to play the guitar, and I thought, well, this guy plays with Chad Atkins. He has got to be one fine guitarist. Oh, you sure were wrong. <laughs> no, I sure, I sure <laughs> was right. You're the one that can play a guitar. I sure was right. I, you're, you're just as humble as Chad was. Oh, well... But um, I want to ask you, um, as a musician, can you give me an idea of some things that you feel like that uh, you absorb from working with him and being with him? Well, Chad always said if you hang around people, you sort of act like them, you know, which I I hope. That by hanging around Chet, I became more like him. Uh, uh, I hope so. But that, being as it may... Musically speaking, uh, when I went to work with Jerry Reed, <clears throat> I didn't think I was, could play worth a damn. I, he had to convince me. It took Jerry two weeks to convince me to go to work with him, because I didn't think I was good enough to work with him. <laughs> you know, because I've been working with, with country acts, and you put three-chord stuff, you know, and, and you play the same 12 tunes every night, you know, and, and uh, no, you don't ever get to play anything. You want everything like a record. Well... You know, it, it, your learning process just uh, hits a brick wall, and you don't, uh, and you you don't have any time to learn anything because you're on the road all the time. You see? So anyway, make a long story short or shorter, <laughs> uh, Jerry really taught me. I, I learned so much from him. Uh, I didn't know how to count time, and I don't mind saying saying that I'm tell all my uh, bad points to help other people. But when I started working with Jerry Reed, I was so ignorant. That I couldn't count time. I didn't know where one was. Jerry said, "Well, you have to find." He had a little old studio over on Eighth Avenue, and he said, "Now I want you to run this studio and do demos and all that." Well, that, that was like telling me to build a rocket car. I didn't know nothing about that. <laughs> I mean, I'd recorded a lot, but it was just going in the studio and recording. You know, as far as the technical aspect of it. And with all those country acts, you didn't have to read charts or anything. You just remember you knew the tune before you got in there, see, mm-hmm. and. Uh, so I had to start that, and I rushed and all that, you know. And Jerry, he, no, no, you got to think down in your head, you know, when you're overdubbing. You know, you got to think, talk to yourself, and slow down, slow down, lay back. Mm-hmm. Well, I really tried, worked on that, and uh, I'd go home and turn WIX on, which was a a station here in Nashville that plays that easy that easy listening country and I'd sit there with a legal pad and write number charts. Huh. And so I mean but 
after working with Jerry for about four years, and then I went with Chet. Well, it's just a matter of learning to do, to do what Chet did, and basically what I did was what he and Jerry did when they worked together. I just sort of took Jerry Reed's place. Chet liked to improvise. When he played a tune, he'd he'd play it. He uh, he always said, "State the melody." That was his <laughs> phrase. And then he liked to improvise. Well, you got to have rhythm to improvise. So I played him. I was his rhythm man, see, so he could do that. Mm -hmm. And I had to really, uh, once in a while, he'd say, you know, he'd turn around and say, lay back. He said, you're right here, Larry. I didn't think it was, but I didn't argue with him, you know. <laughs> and, uh, so I had to learn to really play on the beat and play in a groove, you know. You don't play on top of the beat. Uh, for all you guitar players that don't know, you play a little bit. You don't play behind a beat, but you play in a groove, you know. And uh, that when you play, not many people can play rhythm. If you notice, everybody wants to play lead. They're not satisfied in playing rhythm. But it's hard to play rhythm. A oh, good yeah. rhythm player that scares his hands teeth, you know. Everybody wants to be the star and play, play lead. But uh, I am a good rhythm player if I'm nothing else. And uh, I think we got it down pretty good. Right. Well, you certainly did. I saw you in concert many times. And it was, it was I didn't great. get any letters saying, uh, what are you doing over there? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. The critics uh, didn't get on me, you know, when we was out on the road. <laughs> they always saying, that piano player over there got a sickly tone. That's what they said in Cincinnati one time. <laughs> said the keyboard player got a sickly tone. <laughs> critics. Oh, boy. They never. They can't create anything, but they can tear it down. You yeah, know? That's right. Well, the building we're in has to have so many memories. Oh, yeah. Right down uh, the hall is uh, was Chet's office for many, many years. Mm -hmm. I feel sad seeing somebody else in there, you know, because, uh, man, there was so much happening. That Lenny Bro used to come up, and, and um, there's a famous picture of Chet sitting in his desk looking up at Lenny, and Lenny's got a white hat on, I believe, leaning over Chet's desk with his guitar showing Chet a lick. That's uh -huh. taken down the hall down there. And that was a great office. It was big and quiet, and uh, I just loved to go in there. And uh, But downstairs in Studio A and outside in Studio B, that's where Chet uh, did his part to uh, create Music mm -hmm. City. And I recorded with Jerry down there a lot, Jerry Reed, and Chet, and... Uh, over in Studio B, that's where uh, we were, we cut uh, Jerry's Breakdown. Mm -hmm. That's where that was recorded. Uh huh. And uh, so they had a lot of memories around here. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Enough to fill several volumes. Let me ask you uh, about the recording process with with Chet. Uh, I know you played on many of his records, and I'd like to kind of get an insight from you about that. Okay. But tell me what like what what, the, what well it's just kind of describe what a well what a typical uh, session would be. I'm Chet early on. Uh, uh, I don't know. He, he, sometimes uh, he, he didn't do it while I was with him. Uh, record direct. I, I know he did. Maybe back in the '60s or something on certain tunes or something. But the, almost everything, and he he he, he used that old fifty four stand 1954 stand deal amp. And he used that on his nylon string and his uh, his electric. And when he had other people in there overdubbing, like me or Pat Bergeson or whatever, well, he'd use that amp. That, that was his favorite amp. I never took an amp in there because he loved that amp. And it was the best sounding amp I ever heard. He was real easy to record with. He'd just, uh, I'd go out there and say, well, I want you to play on this section here and I'd sit down trying to find something and maybe he'd already have an idea and say, why don't you do something like this? You know, and you take a guitar and show me and then uh, I'd refine it or add a little to it or something, you know. Mm -hmm. But Chet was the easiest, easiest person in the world to record for. Really? A lot of people might think just the opposite because they yeah. know, that know of him as being a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. I guarantee you, I've recorded a lot of people around town and uh, He's producer, some of them are the biggest bird brains you've ever seen, and they talk to you like, <laughs> you, like you're a nitwit. Chet was just the opposite. He'd go in the studio with an artist, 
And he, when he, two o'clock, he's real prompt, you know. And uh, that's when the session started. Well, uh, he'd get the piano player over, and the artist, and they'd go over and stand around the piano, and they'd run the song down with the piano player. And all the other musicians would write number charts or read, if they already were written, while well, they'd read them, you know. And then the musicians would start working up the arrangement. Mm-hmm. And he'd just stand around and listen. And uh, if he liked what everybody's done, he wouldn't say anything. But if, if he didn't like like it, he'd say, well, I don't know. Why don't you try to find something else, you know. Mm-hmm. That's the way he was. He'd let the musicians see what they had in mind. Yeah. I remember him <clears throat> seeing a television interview that Ralph Emery did with Chet and he asked him basically the same question and I remember that he said something like well he just hire the right people well that's true you know he uh, he uh, mostly hired the same crew uh, it all depends on what type of music he was doing you know what was the typical uh, rhythm section for for the records well he loved Larry Londa he used Larry after he came to town Larry worked with when he first came to town, he worked with Boots Randolph. And Boots and Chet and all of them, they were they they played a lot of days together. So Larry was probably the greatest drummer that's ever been in Nashville. He uh, he played with a field that nobody's ever had. So Chet used him all the time. And he used Terry McMillan percussion. He liked him. and uh, but, but he used other musicians, too. Kenny Malone, he used him a lot. And... Uh, Rhythm guitar, well, he used me just about all the time back in those years. Uh-huh. And um, about five, about, uh, I don't know, I guess it was about four years before Chet got sick and quit, uh, I got tired of doing a recording, so I, I quit. I just did, from that point on, I just did a little bit with Chet. Uh, music changed, and I, they started playing all this airhead country music here. It's nothing but rock and roll, you know, with cowboy hats and... So I just got tired of it, and I just quit. Retired uh-huh. from the studio scene. Uh-huh. And, uh, <clears throat> so uh, Chet got to record more jazz and more pop. And uh, I really didn't like, enjoy playing that real, you know, that real... Well, this thing, that's when you record that stuff, it's real hard. The sessions are real hard when you get into that stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'd... I'd uh, play on them sometimes but uh, most of the time I wouldn't like he'd have a tune or two of a CD he'd be doing you know and he'd want me to do something on it you know wasn't the Stay Tuned album kind of the turning point as far as that direction and you yeah. did work on that there is yeah and we uh, wrote a couple of tunes mm-hmm. that title tune was uh, Chet and I wrote mm-hmm. the reason Chet started doing that uh, that uh, light jazz or whatever you call it he wasn't selling any records mm-hmm and he wasn't getting any airplay. The radio stations wouldn't play his records. Well, if you don't get any airplay, people forget about you and you don't send any records. So Earl, Earl, he and Earl Clue was real good friends. So Earl Clue, that's the kind of stuff he records. And he was selling records like crazy. So Chet wanted to get airplay on. He, he told me, he said, I can get airplay on the FM if I do that kind of music. So he, uh, I think David Hungate produced uh, Stay Tuned. i a great bass player used to be with Toto. He's a fine bass player, musician, and a fine person. Mm-hmm. He produced that album, and uh, they had some of the greatest guitar playing on there, and, uh, Steve Luth- Luthaker, excuse me, and Larry Carlton. Mm-hmm. And that was a big thrill for me. Uh, Larry Carlton played on uh, one of the tunes, and then I overdubbed on it, too, so I got to play with Larry Carlton. He didn't know it at the time, but I did. So that was a big <laughs> thrill for me, and he's one of my idols, and Sure. They have some of the greatest musicians. That's one of the best albums I ever heard. I don't care if Chet or anybody else. From a standpoint of a musician and guitar player, boy, it's some great playing on that. Oh, yes, it certainly is. Okay, Paul, I want to ask you um, about some of your experiences on the road with Chet. Oh, me, well, we played, you know, Wolf Trap and played uh, Carnegie Hall five times, I believe. And uh, that was that mm-hmm. was great. And... Uh, we played uh, with every major symphony in mm-hmm. the United States. Chet liked to work with symphonies. and mm-hmm. I didn't particularly like to work with them because they're so snooty. Mm-hmm. Symphony musicians, they, they look down on pop and anybody that's making money. <laughs> they don't like, they resent the fact that 
that somebody like me could go in there and make more money than the first violinist sitting there. You know? <laughs> uh-huh. you know, they won't speak to you. You know, they wouldn't go walk around their nose in the air. You know. <laughs> but anyway, I hope some of them are listening. <laughs> they're pretty good here in Nashville. Yeah, they, well, Nashville's the, the reason they are because they work in the studios, right? Lot. See, they're 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 more down to earth people. And they have a respect for what the Nashville musicians do. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I don't know. It's just uh, we uh, year after year we went to Europe mm-hmm. two or three times. And uh, did Chet like playing in Europe, or did he prefer staying in the United States? I think he enjoyed it, but as he got older, it's real it, it's real hard on him. You know, boy, at, uh, jet lag. You go over and. And myself, we'd we'd go over and get to England, and I didn't know who I was for three days. <laughs> I know that you used to quite often work on Chet's guitars and amplifiers. Yeah, and uh, I did just about all of it, mm-hmm. unless it was something real major, and then he'd get Gibson mm-hmm. to do it. Mm-hmm. But I was I self taught. I got tired of having to get people to do it, and I didn't like the way they was doing it, so I learned to do it myself. And I just uh huh. And Chet always liked the way I set guitars up, huh. and so I just. If I came up with something a little different on mine, I'd do it to his too, you know. Uh-huh. In closing, I want to ask you uh, two two questions. Uh, Who's buried in Grant's tomb? Right. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln. What color was the old gray mare? <laughs> I'll try to make them a little harder than that. Okay. All right. One thing I, I hear out of Chet's friends, they always comment about Chet's sense of humor, and they feel like the general public really didn't get a chance to experience his humor. He had a dry wit, mm-hmm. but he was funny. I mean, funny as hell. He was, uh, he just cracked people up, you know. I don't know where he'd come up with these uh, jokes, but just comments. He's sort of like, you know, I mean, W.C. Fields, you know. He started talking out under his breath a little bit, and and uh, he'd, every night he'd say something different, but it would be funny, just, you know, just a comment. So he was a, he had a great sense of humor. Mm-hmm. And he he always said I made him laugh. He was always talking about that. And I'd always, when I was around him, I was always saying things. And I was a little more cynical than he was, giving me politicians and this and that, you know. You know, I, I don't know if in I ever. In general, I was giving him a hell and he'd laugh. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I've ever told you this or not, but I remember one time he told me, he says, I always look forward to going to the airport and meeting Paul when he just finished reading the morning paper. <laughs> <laughs> and we'd, I'd, I'd, I'd get the world report. <laughs> I was a lot more outspoken than Chet was. He 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 didn't want to create any controversy. And I never I never gave a damn. I just said what I believe. <laughs> well, in closing, I want to ask you, what do you feel the legacy of Chet Atkins? Oh me, is I know that's a big question. He's just, it'll be the biggest ever. I mean, uh, he's in the same category with uh, Django Reinhardt. I mean, he's up on that level. I think Chet was the greatest all-around guitar player who ever lived. He could play anything he wanted to play. Mm-hmm. And uh, you could listen to his albums, and that bears that out. He had a great ear for tone. He got the beautiful tone all the time. His technique was impeccable. Uh, he'll just uh, he'll always be the, the guy that everybody wants to play like. I mean, uh, I don't know anybody else will ever take his place, ever. I don't care. As good as Lenny Bro was, and Lenny Bro was as good as you can get. And Lenny said to himself, you know, he said, there's only one Chet. He was just a great human being, kind, generous, and one of the greatest musicians that ever lived. Mm -hmm. Self-taught man. You know, it's amazing. When you look at what he did in his life, you can't believe that one person could do all that. It's just unbelievable. It's like five lifetimes in one, isn't it? And five great lifetimes in one. He was the best of the best. 